Hi there, welcome Disability Law Show. Good to have you along on the show today. John Scholes with me as well. Savan Tamarkin and Tamar Gopian Partners and Firu Tamarkin LLP, the most positively reviewed law firm in the country. Reaching out anytime, 1-855-821. 5900. That's the phone number. Email is help at disabilityrights.ca. There's some more contact information I'll give you throughout the show. But guys, on the show today, a little later on, three tips on how to communicate with your insurance adjuster. This is going to be fun, but we'll get to that in just a bit. But we always start off with the week that was. What do you got for me, pal? John, this yep. week uh, I talked to a few individuals. It's interesting, actually, because it was the same issue that came up. Uh, different fact scenarios, but same issue. Uh, so several individuals from uh, two different provinces, okay. British Columbia and uh, Ontario, where we have offices, uh, along with Alberta, of course. But these two individuals that I spoke with, unrelated to each other, uh, are both calling on behalf of a family member that had been denied. So each one of them had a family member that was denied long-term disability for okay. different reasons. The commonality between the two is that both individuals who were denied had appealed that denial. Uh, one of them appealed twice, the other one appealed three times. And then, and they were denied. Denied, denied, denied. You know, like the John Grisham books. Uh, uh, and, and what's interesting is that those individuals that had been denied long-term disability walked away from their claims. And they are disabled. They're unable to work. For, again, different reasons. One of them had a mental health issue. The other one had more of a physical uh, and neurological uh, progressive disease. But the point is the insurance companies that they had applied to for long-term disability, and they had long-term disability coverage, each one of them through health benefits at work, they had been denied. And so uh, I had spoken to both of them, to, to both family members, and, uh, and then subsequently spoke with uh, the individuals themselves who had told me that, look, we've appealed, we did what the insurance company told us to do, which is appeal the denial, provide all the updated medical records from the insurance companies, and yet the insurance company continued to deny us our claim. And so we, we figured there's nothing else that we can do. And this is such a common thing that we see, Tamara and I and the rest of our team in all our offices, insurance companies are playing this game. They're denying your claim, oftentimes for completely stupid reasons and wrong reasons. Okay, I'm not afraid to say that. I'll, they have a bag of tricks. They will deny you for anything they can deny you for. Uh, and, and then they'll tell you in that letter of denial, the last, second last paragraph, you can appeal this. Appeal this to us, uh, we're going to look at it, give us uh, any uh -huh. new medical documentation, whatever. And so people don't understand that these appeals, in my experience, I'm sure tomorrow will say something similar. Frankly, every LTD lawyer I have spoken to says something similar. These appeals, for the most part, are useless. Now, I'm never going to say that they never work, just like I never say that if you play the lotto, you're never going to win. Right. Okay? It can <laughs> happen. You can get yeah. struck by lightning. But the reality is it is a game. You are essentially... Uh, giving control to the insurance company to play around with you. They are essentially creating a situation where you're like a hamster on a wheel. Mm -hmm. And at some point you'll get tired, you'll get aggravated, your uh, health will deteriorate you because of this, you'll give up. And, and so what is the option, the alternative? It's very simple. It's allowing us to take over the reins and then go after them with the legal tools that are available to you and to us. And that's what the insurance company does not want you to know. We can use the law to force them to pay you what you are owed. It's that simple. But if you appeal the decision, you're not appealing it to a third party, you know, to, to an arbitrator, to, to a judge, to a court. No. You are literally appealing the denial to the exact same company that denied you in the first place. What is their incentive to approve you? Mm -hmm. So anyways, long story short, we see this time and time again. It was just interesting that this past week, I had spoken to two family members in two different provinces with the exact same issue. And of course, when I looked at the documentation, the denial letters, the medical documents, I told them, you have cases. The insurance companies are wrong in both instances to deny these claims. And frankly, I actually don't even think it's going to be that difficult to get those insurance companies to the table to pay those claims. But to do that, you need to know this area of law. You need to have the experience, the expertise, the know-how, the reputation. I can tell you, Tamar is sitting beside me. I may embarrass you here, but I can tell you there was one case shortly after she started with us, I think it was shortly after, where you had sent a letter to the insurance company who had denied the claim, and just by virtue of your initial letter asking for the insurance company's file, either somebody called you from the insurance company or they wrote you a letter saying, we made a mistake, <laughs> we're reinstating Absolutely. that person. I mean, think about that. She sent a letter, and by virtue of her name, the firm name, our experience, the insurance company understood that, you know, that's it. You know, they can't get away with it. They, they're going to have to pay. 
And we see this time and time again. And so if you're in that situation or if you know someone in that situation, please do not give up. Certainly not before speaking with us. And we'll tell you, if you don't have a case, we'll tell you you don't have a case. If you have a case, we will tell you that you have a case and we'll give you your options. And then you'll be informed, you'll be empowered, and then the ball is in your court in what you want to do. You know, tomorrow it's interesting, that whole appeal thing, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, however many people decide to go down that road. It's kind of disheartening for people on, for claimants because they think, oh, it's an appeal. This is my safety net. They're throwing me a, they're throwing me a bone here. hundred percent. And, and, John, you're not going to see it in the policy anywhere. You're, it's just yeah. this contrived process, exactly what Savan said, to wear you down, tire you out, you give up. And I want to pick up on something important that Savan mentioned as well, is that we take on that burden. And I appreciate when family members reach out on behalf of disability claimants who've had that door slammed in their face multiple times. Because certainly I can tell you, usually by the point where they're complaining to family members, they're exhausted, they probably can't deal with going on further. But if you've got a family member to, to support you, we're happy to work with a team. We're happy to work with the family members, the claimant, your medical records, your doctors, everybody who's going to support that disability claim and has been probably for a number of years. We're happy to coordinate with all of those individuals, and we do that. That's part of our services. And we try and allow the individual who's already been through the ringer to just focus on their health. They become our problem, and I'm happy to have them as my problem, John, because as Savannah said, we write letters, we push the envelope with them, and we get them to come to the table efficiently and do the things that they never wanted to do, which is to deny, 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 and hope that you walk away. Again, can all start with a phone call, real simple chat, right? 1-855-821-5900 to either Tamar or Savan, member of their team, no problem. Use that phone number anytime. Help at disabilityrights.ca to drop an email by. Uh, there's also a website we use on our other show, the Employment Law Show, Savan, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Yes, it's got tons to do with employment, which Tamar also covers. But there's a section in there on disability law as well, right? You love it. Yeah, I do. And, and you know, when we first created the Pocket Employment Lawyer, that was Lior's brainchild. Yep. Uh, we talked about the fact that many of our clients don't just have employment issues, they have employment issues and long-term disability issues, right? People who are on long-term disability and have issues with their employer being let go or something's happening with their employment situation, they want answers, but vice versa. You know, they're, they're at work, they're having issues potentially at work, but at the same time, they're having issues with their disability provider. Maybe they're getting cut off. And so what we decided to do is to provide this unique website to people free of charge, and it allows you to then get specific answers to your questions, uh, again, for free, anonymously. And if at that point afterwards you want to get more information from us, you want to have a consultation for free, by all means, click a button and, you know, the program will connect you. But if not, that's fine. You go to that website, you get your, your questions answered on the employment side of things and on the disability side of things. Uh, and again, free, quick, uh, and it's been used thousands of times, John, across the country. Yep. Again, anonymous to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. But first email of the show, guys, again, help at disabilityrights.ca if you want to reach out anytime. Carlos is the first one for the show. Says, I've been on LTD for uh, almost two years due to depression. The insurance company recently referred me to their health care provider to do an assessment. After the assessment, an occupational therapist in the return to work department contacted me. Is the insurance company trying to pressure me to return to work? When do I say yes? How quickly do I say yes? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. That's yeah. exactly what's happening here, John. And I appreciate Carlos reaching out to us. So let's unpack this a little bit. The insurance company does have a variety of tools that they will use to try and adjudicate your claim. So yes, they'll issue that monthly disability benefit, but what they're looking for is the ending. How quickly can we get from paying you month to month to that end period where we don't have to pay you anymore? And one of the ways they do that is to try and pressure you back to work. And in order to do that, they have to do a few things. I mean, they don't have to, I suppose, but they will try and do a couple of things. They'll have you assessed by one of their own doctors, and they'll take that assessment and they'll look at the recommendations that they paid for and try and apply those recommendations to you by way of treatment. Then they'll set you up potentially with their own treatment provider and get you to go through that treatment with the ultimate goal, most likely, to return you back to work. So think about that. Think about what the insurance company is doing. They are now spending money over and above the monthly amount that they're paying you so that they can achieve the point where they can close the claim. So 
Let's not mince words here. This is a somewhat biased approach. So if you're Carlos, yes, you have a duty to cooperate with these efforts. You do have to go through the assessment process and you probably have to go through the rehabilitation or whatever therapeutic treatment options they have for you ongoing. But it is extremely important to always engage your own medical team. Because if you're getting into situations where the treatment itself is not progressing in the way that perhaps the insurance company had hoped, or perhaps it's not helping you at all whatsoever, perhaps it's harming you, then you want your medical team to be there, not only to document that progress or lack thereof, but also to be ready to support that when the insurance company inevitably says, okay, well, you've done the eight week treatment, we think you're ready to get back to work, that your own doctor, your own treatment provider can then step up and say, okay, you know what, my patient is simply not ready, Thank you very much, insurance company, but they continue to meet the test of total disability and they should continue getting their disability benefit. Two years though, so Savan, you've got one side with Carlos has his own medical team dealing with him for the last two years, at least the length of time he's been on LTD, and now the insurance company has their people coming on. I mean, if this were ever to go to court, which in most cases this never does, I mean, what has, has more gravitas, which has more weight? Obviously, Carlos's team. Yes, Carlos's team, 100%. Right? And, and you know, the other thing to consider is that when the insurance company sends you to be seen by one of their specialists, experts, doctors, whoever it is they're sending you to, these are hired guns. And, and you know, we've talked a lot about this on the show about IMEs, which is what this is, independent medical examination. You notice the word independent, yeah. okay? It's anything but independent. <laughs> that's right. The insurance company handpicks whoever it is that's gonna be assessing you. They're the ones paying that person. So that person makes money off of this assessment and many other assessments like that from the insurance company. They may be the best treatment provider to their own patients, but when you're hired by the insurance company to do an assessment on an ongoing basis, and that's part of your income, you gotta call into question their objectivity. Mm -hmm. And so, again, to fast track this, John, you're right, most of these cases never ever go to court. This is not American TV, okay? It's not an American TV show, legal show. These things get settled, why? Because insurance companies understand that they're gonna get hammered if this goes to court. As recently happened, in a case in Ontario with Blue Cross, yeah. where a jury awarded the lady that had been denied by the insurance company $1.5 million in Man. punitive damages against the insurance company. So I'm just bringing this as an aside to show you why insurance companies are definitely afraid of going to court. But you're absolutely right in, the, in, the, you know, in, in asking the question, well, if this went to court, who would the judge believe? Well, think about this if you were the judge. You're seeing a person that's disabled, you're seeing a hired gun hired by the insurance company who has never treated this person. On the other hand, you're seeing a medical team that's been treating this person for two plus years. Who are you gonna listen to at the end of the day? You know, if you had to weigh the probabilities here, you're most likely gonna listen to whoever has been taking care of this person and treating that person and giving you their honest opinion, medical opinion. So something to consider there, that the insurance company, again, they're trying whatever they can, they have all these tools at their disposal to try and figure out how to cut off your benefits, how to stop that monetary bleed, uh, and, and they'll do it hoping you will not ask questions, hoping that you're simply gonna walk away from money that's owed to you. And Carlo also said, you know, went to see or having a, an assessment with their, with their people. Sometimes you mentioned on past shows, sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a paper review. What, I mean, you don't even see one of their doctors. It's all on paper. I mean, what is that? that that's exactly right, John. It actually typically will start with a paper review. Right. And so, you know, they're not assessing this individual. Think about a situation where, I mean, it could be a physical disability or a mental health disability. Either way, if they're not actually seeing you and examining you face to face, it's a huge failing on the insurance company's right. behalf. And of course, your treatment providers are going to be preferred in the eyes of the court. Frankly, it should be preferred over the eyes of the adju adjusters as well, but mm -hmm. we know what their mission is. Right. Break, short one. When we come back, three tips on how to communicate with your insurance adjuster. Key information here. Stick around for it. In the meantime, that phone number, 1 855 821 5900. And you want to send along an email anytime as well. Help at disability rights. .ca. Coming right back. People think contractors aren't owed severance. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Many contractors are actually employees and are entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just going to walk away. Your insurer may ignore you, they may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. 
We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks' pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with The Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, welcome back to Disability Law Show. Good to have you on the show again this week. I'm John Scholes. With me, of course, Savan Tamarkin and Tamar Gopian Partners, Sanfiru Tamarkin, LLP. You can reach out anytime, 1-855-821-5900. Also go to disabilityrights.ca, the firm website. All kinds of information there to be learned and also a media tab. We do radio shows across the country, of course. The guys practicing in Ontario and Alberta and BC as well, so feel free to reach out. Uh, topic for the day, guys. Three tips on how to communicate with your insurance adjuster. We're going to try to keep this civil because we know how spicy this can get. But the first one is this. Always ask for a copy of your disability policy to be informed on all policy provisions. Yes. Some dry reading right there. Yeah, very dry reading, yes. If you want to fall asleep within 30 seconds or less, uh, by all means. However, it's very important. And, you know, I recently dealt with an individual that the insurance company refused for whatever reason to give him the policy. Look, they can't. That's the contract. That's the paper that governs the relationship between him and the insurance company. Now, uh, if you go to that website that uh, we had mentioned on, on previous shows, John, uh, LTDFAQ, Long-Term Disability Frequently Asked Questions.ca, LTDFAQ.ca, there is a short memo there that uh, for each one of the provinces where we practice, Ontario, BC, and Alberta, it provides you with the legislation, the actual provisions awesome. that entitle you to copies of these policies. And so if the adjuster is not playing ball with you, quote those provisions to them. And if that doesn't work, go to the ombudsperson for the insurance company. Just raise hell. And the reason for this is because at some point, I can almost guarantee you, at some point during the claim, the life of the claim that you have with the insurance company, the insurance company is going to tell you something. Either they're going to want you to do something or they're going to tell you that they can deduct something. They're going to tell you something about your claim that you're not going to be happy with. And so what I tell people to do is tell the adjuster, give me a copy of my policy and then show me where in the policy it says that you can do that. Where does it say that I have to do this? Where does it say you're entitled to reduce my monthly benefits by that? Show me the provision. And so by doing that, you are forcing them to focus on the contract, which is exactly, again, what this is. Mm -hmm. This is a contract. The insurance company must respect the contract just like you must respect the contract. And if they breach that contract, then you're entitled to go after them for whatever it is that you wrote. But again, very, very important to ask from the outset. And by the way, sometimes if it's a group health um, uh, policy through work, uh, your HR, you know, people at work, your company may have a copy of this. So they may be able to give that to you as well. But always ask for a copy of the policy. And the second one tomorrow kind of dovetails into what Savannah just said. If you're unsure of anything in that policy or confused for that matter, always reach out to the adjuster to explain, especially in writing as well, right? 100%. And oh. in, in writing is key, John. They have that obligation to put it to you in writing and actually explain it to you in writing. So I'm going to give a very simple example, the decline letter. They're form letters, actually, that these adjusters have, and they just plug it in play. And so there's no excuse for them not to include whatever provision they're relying upon to deny your claim. And if it's not in there, if they haven't explained it, get them to explain it and actually put it in writing that you've received the letter and you've said, I either don't understand it and or you haven't put an explanation in here as to what part of the policy you're relying upon to decline my claim. I understand that it can be really overwhelming to get a letter like this. Anything coming from the insurance company is going to have a lot of legal jargon stuck in there. Mm -hmm. But it should, because it is a plug and play, have certain elements. The first part should acknowledge what it is they're talking to you about. We're writing to you because. Then it should talk about this is the part of, part of the policy that we're talking to you about. And then the third should, should, part should be this is our explanation or for whatever it is that we're saying. We see these letters all the time, John, but we also see letters that don't follow this format. And then people are confused. Did my claim get denied? They said my claim was closed. They said I could appeal. What does that mean? Don't worry about it. Free consultation. Give us a call. Send me the letter. I'm happy to review it. But at the end of the day, if you don't have it in writing, if they just give you a phone call, that's no good. 
you really want to commit them to that written explanation because it puts their feet to the fire. Then you know how to respond once you have that written letter. Or, or and, that, and that is tip number three, Savannah. Make sure it's all documented, confirmed in writing. What if you don't get a response? Yeah. Doesn't matter. Okay. As long as you confirm what was said, right. as right. long as you confirm what your understanding is, uh, that's key. Whether or not they respond or not is irrelevant. The point is, you've put it out there, and so if there is a problem down the road, if we have to get involved, we're not looking at all the emails. They can simply say, well, no, that's incorrect. Well, you didn't respond back to this person writing you X, Y, and Z. Uh, but, but you're right that, uh, you know, we just talked about this. So, John, I have a bonus uh, tip, which is really, really uh, crucial here, which, cool. I, which I want to uh, uh, outline, uh, and I'm sure Tamar will agree. Please, when you're communicating with the insurance company, with your adjuster, be on your guard. Do not assume that the adjuster, no matter how nice he or she is, that they're your friend. They're not. They are not. Their job is to protect the insurance company. I'll give you an example. I had a situation one time, uh, and we've talked about this before, John, where this person was suffering from mental health issues. And of course, you know, when somebody calls you and they say, how are you doing? Gen right. Exactly. Fine. I mean, this is just Excellent. a generic response. Yeah. I'm doing fine today. Um, and then the conversation continued on for the next 20 minutes about all the difficulties this person was having, except that down the road when we got involved, when I got involved, and I'm looking at that phone call that happened that day, yeah. it says, you know, uh, uh, Mr. So-and-so said that he was fine that day. Yeah. Everything was okay. And so they cherry pick. And so my point is that you have to make sure that you understand that the person on the other side of the, you know, the, other side of the line, uh, the person working for the insurance company, they can be the nicest person, they can be a, a good person, but they have a job to do, and their job is to protect the insurance company. Uh, I, I can tell you that I've said this point before many times, and uh, I've, I've gotten some angry emails from some adjusters saying, no, that's not true, you know, we always look out for the best interest of the individual. Well, maybe they think they do, but I can tell you, when I get that phone call from this crying person, uh, a grown-up person that is crying because they've been denied their claim, and they're showing me the denial letter, and the denial letter then makes reference to cherry-picked information that was provided to the adjuster, you know, I, I just don't buy it. And so be on your guard when you're communicating with the insurance company. Don't simply assume that they're there to help you. Understand that you have a contract in place. The only reason they're paying you it's not out of charity, it's because they're obligated to pay you. And if they stop paying you, but you're still disabled, you may have a claim for more benefits. And that's where we can help. More questions anytime, mydisabilityquestions.com. That's a website you can use that's free and anonymous, and that's where we're going to go after a short break, which is coming up now. Phone number, 1-855-821-5900 as well. We'll continue with more of the Disability Law Show. People think you have to sign back a severance offer by a deadline. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Deadlines are used as a pressure tactic. Make sure the offer is fair before you sign. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Can insurance companies deny long-term disability claims for mental illness? When you're suffering from a mental health disability, insurance companies just don't understand. But we do. They can absolutely not force you back to work. If your doctors say you are not ready and you know you're not ready, they cannot make you go back to work. If you have a mental health disability and your claim is denied, don't give up. Give us a call and let us fight for you. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back and get what you're owed. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for-cause terminations are false and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, thanks for hanging in. Welcome back. A few minutes to go in the Disability Law Show. I mentioned just before the break another website, which is free and anonymous for you to use anytime. MyDisabilityQuestions.com. Guys, I want to get one from Tara. This one's perfect because it really covers everything we've talked about on the, on the show today. It's just a big bowl of wrong. Tara writes in, she says, I'm currently on a wait list for a treating psychiatrist. In the meantime, my request for LTD benefits was unexpectedly denied. I've been told to file an appeal with my insurer. Is this the best option for me now? No, no, not the best option for you now, Tara. And it does cover a lot of the topics we yep. talked about on the show. So let's first start off with the idea that she's on a wait list for a treating psychiatrist. 
mental health claims, I, I'm so passionate about these issues, John. We talk about it on all our shows, the radio show and so on, because we really have seen a greater incidence of this. There's a huge rise, particularly in women, across the country, and the access to this treatment is really delayed, it's yep. backlog, it's diminishing. And so you've got a lot of individuals like Tara who are trying to access this treatment and hoping that in the meantime, they can be and getting their long-term disability benefits. And lo and behold, the insurance company cuts them off in her situation unexpectedly. Two problems with that. Number one, insurance companies don't like to wait. Why? Because they have to issue that monthly benefit month over month while you wait to get on the, the treatment with your psychiatrist. However, the test to, in order to continue getting your disability benefits in a lot of policies just simply says, are you totally disabled from being able to work? And typically, most of these individuals are, so long as they're not getting the treatment that they need from a mental health specialist. Just because the insurance company doesn't, doesn't want to wait doesn't mean you're not entitled to your disability benefit. So I have a real problem with that element of it. The second issue, of course, is the fact that it's unexpected. As we talked about in our prior segments, they can't just willy-nilly cut you off. I mean, they may, but they're really exposing themselves to a potential damages claim when they do that, and they don't provide some reasonable explanation in order for denying those benefits. And so, you know, the idea of appealing in a situation like this, I don't see this moving the needle with the insurance company at all whatsoever, especially when she clearly has the support to actually go and see a psychiatrist for further treatment. What do you think, Savannah? I agree with you 100 percent. I, I will tell you, John, that as much as it's difficult for us to get those calls and those emails and talk to these kinds of individuals because you can just see the black and white, the wrong that was done to them, on the other hand, for us, it is such a, I'm not going to, I'm hesitant to say easy, but it, it is one of those cases where just when we want to jump in there mm -hmm. and grab the insurance company's throat and just shake them. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, this is one of those cases, Tamar, you tell me if you agree or not, where if we got involved, it's a very high likelihood, I think, that they'll reverse position at the outset. Absolutely. We're not talking about a year, two years wait or any of that. Yeah. I mean, this is, there are cases, I'm not kidding, there are cases where we get involved, even after the person has been battling the insurance company for months and months and months, where suddenly, because they know that now there are people who know what they're doing, right. lawyers who have expertise in this area, who've, you know, gone around the ring quite a few times uh, and beat these insurance companies up, they understand. And so these insurance companies oftentimes reverse course. Why? Because they understand it's going to cost them a lot more if they get into a fight with us. And so that's what people need to understand, that you know, it feels like there is this power disbalance. The reality is the, that power disbalance is, is in optics only. You simply don't know. And I'm not blaming people for not knowing. It's not their field. This is what we do. But insurance companies prey on that. And the reality is that quite a few people out there, probably a large majority, I would think, simply assume they have no options. They have no rights. They either have to appeal or they just might as well walk away. Mm -hmm. And those are the two worst things you can happen for your case. The best thing you can do is contact us for free just to get the information you need. And we'll tell you if you have a case. In this case, without seeing anything else, no question in my mind that we can help this person. Absolutely. It won't be, it could be more than one appeal. It might be several appeals. It could be two years down the road and still no satisfaction, right? It's no good. This is the challenge. And, right? and all you're doing is you're going without your funds and you're, you're battling to try and access treatment in a situation right. like Tara. Let us at least take one of those problems away. Let us deal with that. We are great at what we do, and we know how to speak their language. And it. so we know what we're gonna, how we're going to present a case like this. And in my mind, I agree with Savannah. It's sort of open and shut. Tara, hope the answer was good because the uh, letter sure was. Appreciate that. You can reach out now that we are done. Tara, you as well, anytime, 1-855-821-5900, the phone number we always direct you to. That particular letter came from mydisabilityquestions.com. Free and anonymous website for you. And the email, of course, help at disabilityrights.ca. Again, help at disabilityrights.ca. Anytime, your email might appear on a future show as well. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you next time on the Disability Law Show.